Welcome to Community of Writers at Pima Community College. I'm Charles Alexander. Usually I come to you as a, as a poet uh, talking about literature. Today I'm coming to you as a, both a book maker and an appreciator of books. I direct a poet's press and have for over 30 years. And by poet's press I mean the decisions are made not for commercial reasons, but for the same aesthetic reasons that as a poet I create works in writing. Right now I'm holding a book um, printed and bound by Virginia Woolf and Leonard Woolf of the Hogarth Press and it is uh, the first English translation of the poet Rainer Maria Rilke's Duino Elegies and it was printed in the, in the 1930s. And it's maybe one of the more famous examples of such a book uh, printed by someone who was involved both with the creation of literature and the creation of books. Now such pairings go back a long way. And in the early days of printing in Western Europe, you, know, you think of Johannes Gutenberg and of course his famous Bible and other books he printed. On equipment, though, that before the development of movable type had been used for printing etchings and artworks. And so there was a marriage of art and words from the very beginning of the tradition of the book in Europe. You know, in the late 18th century, you know, William Blake gives us an example of illuminated books. This is a page from his work, Jerusalem, in which both the art is from copper plate etching, but so is the text of the book. So he's marrying in one plate um, literature and art, in this case both by himself, although he printed books by others too, and he tended to have a very um, classical kind of sense of what he was doing in the form of the book. Of course, before there, were, there was mu movable type and the printing of books. There were hand uh, written books, uh, manuscript books. We know uh, existing books of hours and this was an elegant item for noble houses. Now pretty soon with the development of printing, books became much more uh, mass produced and used in schools and pretty soon houses had books, more people were reading and there was a demand for books. In the 20th century though, uh, and 21st century now, we have seen that some, the traditional ways of making books with setting type by hand and printing have become more the province of artist bookmakers. And so I brought several items of books that are hand printed in our own time, including uh, by myself, to talk about the marriage of text, uh, mostly poetry, and books from something simple, like a simply folded book cover of four poems by the American poet Charles Bernstein that must be, that include an artwork by Tucson artist Cynthia Miller, and that must be unfolded in order to be read and experienced. In my mind, this is a kind of an elegant but somewhat playful home for the poem. But it is also something that asks the reader to get involved physically in some way. And I think that is an important aspect of bookmaking for me, that the book or the, the poem because, becomes something physical, not only just something to which um, any method of printing is kind of background, but something which involves hands, movement uh, on the part of the reader. Another example of that is a book I printed in the 1980s by two West Coast American poets, Lynn Hagenian and Kit Robinson, uh, which, are, which began as poems they wrote to each other. Uh, and they considered these individual poems, and the title of the book became Individuals. Once they accumulated a number of them, they thought, well, this would be something good to bring together. So the, t the attempt was to, yes, to bring it together, but also to keep separation, that each poem was an individual thing. And this, po this book can be displayed 
um, any number of ways. It can be a little rounded uh, carousel of a book. It can be an elongated accordion of a book. Or it can be held in one's hands and read more or less as any book. So Individuals by Lynn Higinian and Kit Robinson. One of the great, most fun and moving projects I've had the ability to work with was with a group of Yaki people from here in southern Arizona who came to me at some point that teenagers among the Yaki people were reviving a set of songs that they call coyote songs. And the coyotes were in some ways the protectors of the land and there was a sense that the land was being threatened. And some poems having to do with these songs. Some, these songs had been printed in a newspaper and kind of just thrown away because of the newspaper. And I was asked to make something durable and permanent and elegant. And I made this book called Coyote Songs. And it was translated by uh, Felipe Molina, who's a Yaqui singer, with an introduction by him and by Larry Evers, who's a scholar working on Yaqui materials, with paintings on pages by uh, Cynthia Miller, and then with the poems on colored pages, because there's a sense of color, and in some cases even the flower world, in these poems. And the poems print both in a transliteration of the Yaqui language, which, which presents the sounds of the Yaqui language, and translations into English. And you can even tell the kind of, uh, in, in some ways, militant nature of this poetry. You know, the first poem is called Soldier Leaders. You soldier leaders, go ahead beautifully with the mask, with the headdress. Out, out, then walk, out, out, then walk. Walk, 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 walk. Go ahead beautifully with a parrot wing covered green with the mask, with the headdress, out, out, then walk, out, out, then walk, 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 walk. And it tells you the first time the bow dancers come out, they bless the ground in the four directions, first to the east, then the north, the south, and finally the west. The bow dancers do this because they have a special obligation to protect Hiakim, the sacred lands of the Yaquis. Once we produced that book, um, it seemed clear that there was a demand for it and we wanted to get the book in the hands of children and students. So we also made a more conventional uh, printed uh, sort of journal format book of the same material so that that could exist as something libraries could preserve and collect uh, and something that could inexpensively be given to schools. And in fact, we gave copies free to schools in the Tucson area that had Yaqui children. So my uh, working life as a poet has been mixed with this life of collaboration with other poets on book projects. And one of my favorites is by Carl Jung which is a book of Japanese ghost stories in poem uh, format, which makes a lot of use of notions of things hidden, things inside, things outside. And this is called Five Kwaidan in sleeve pages. And the sleeve pages are pages which open like record sleeves and have printing inside large enough that it can be read, but it again involves the reader to almost enter the book in order to experience the book. And there was that sense of wanting uh, poetry not to be something that one could just read on a page and say, oh yes, I get that, but rather to enter in some more physical way. So this is, uh, sometimes books I do are more simple. You know, there's a book here by a uh, Southern Arizona poet who's also known as a, as a rancher and something, as a cow, something of a cowboy, 
Drummond Hadley, and this book, The Light Before Dawn, printed in a kind of a light yellow color, um, is a kind of final selection of his poems which came out um, at the end of his life and was involved with a, a, a constant sense of experiencing the landscape and begins that the rains and the rising sun should come to my eyes once more. I remember first the slow beginning of the light before dawn. And that light before dawn becomes the title of the book and the entry into the poems. Some books are more uh, elaborate. I worked with a New Mexico poet named Meme Bersenbrugge for uh, about a year on this project called Mizu. And Meme is of um, Asian American heritage, and she wrote this book, which is like a fairy tale of a boy entering the water and going under the water, and in some ways never coming out of the water. And so we made the book in a long accordion format, which occurs under a water line, or in this case, a imagined blue painted water line. And so it's a very long book, a little unwieldy to unfold, but one can unfold it and display it and have it read that way. Or again, one can hold it in the hands and read it as a fairly, um, as one would normally read a book. The boy gets out of the water in this way, and I'll read the last of it. He began to recreate inside his mind each crevasse and the arrangement of plants and the people he had visited there. His memory was a glimmer on thin underside of the bone at the top of his skull, and it would strike a stripe of violet or orange red, which would resonate as he went on to the next thing that had happened to him, each tone lasting three or four beats into the next tone, so that when he remembered his ascent, in order for the color cont to continue onto white shore, it had to break a piece out of the skull, and its vapor enveloped him. And he became a crane, able to disguise his escape as migration, as if an old crane would come back in the spring. This means that there's an interesting story here. Sometimes the materials you get to work with as a bookmaker, you can see the cover of this book with this light sort of flecks of a gray color is a Japanese handmade paper. Sometime later after this book, I wanted to find that paper again, and I went to uh, a Japanese art supply store in Chicago, which I knew was very good at such things. And after about a year, they came back to me and told me that there was one person in Japan who had made this paper, and he had died, and so the paper was no longer available. Of course, in Japan, uh, people like paper makers and bookbinders can become national living treasures. And this is, this is an art much appreciated in that country and much borrowed from among bookmakers in this country. Okay, I'm only going to show you one other book, which is Witness by Kathleen Fraser, which is a true collaboration with Tucson artist Nancy Tokar Miller. And Kathleen and Nancy both imagined uh, this witnessing of, in fact, the uh, 911 events. And you can see the book itself has a flattened landscape. And the images explore kind of possible explosions and implosions of materials while the text takes you to, or as it says on this page, all day we sit inside of war to the other end. So this was a really moving book that was also important um, to the press I direct and to, I think, a community of people that um, have been able to be impacted by the book's witnessing of those events. So my life with bookmaking continues. Uh, it's an exploration that never ends. Thank you. This is Community of Poets, Community of Writers. <laughs>